All right, welcome everyone to our webinar today, where we'll be discussing a new tool and specific actions that you can take to be urban forest pest ready. We're also unveiling and reviewing the newly developed urban forest pest readiness playbook. The playbook provides actions to close gaps in readiness and response capabilities between community leaders managing urban forests and state and federal responders. Great. Uh, Adriana, did you have some housekeeping? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the call to get today. My name, again, is Adriana Esquita Land. I'm with a contracted firm, Samara Group, and we've been really actively involved in developing this urban forest pest readiness playbook. I'm really happy to see all of the people on the line today that are joining to learn a little bit more about it. So just a couple um, quick pieces of housekeeping here. Um, the webinar will be recorded and it will be made available on YouTube by our Washington Invasive Species Council partners um, within the next few weeks. And we'll follow up with all of you with more um, details about that, about where to go and where to find it to watch it. If you have any um, issues hearing us or seeing the screen, please feel free to send us a chat. Um, we'll be moderating that. And then as we go, we won't have any questions um, answered directly during the webinar, but please, um, if from your machine in your go-to webinar panel, you should see a drop-down option for questions. Please submit your questions there at any point during the webinar, and then we'll have about 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to uh, review those and answer those um, with the time that we have available. And um, just to say this webinar is about an hour long in total is the goal here. We'll have about 40 minutes of presentation slides from our partners and I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves as we get into that. And then about 15 minutes at the end around um, 1245 we'll get into Q&A um, to answer any questions you might have. Um, I think that'll about do us. I'll um, like, I would like to introduce our first presenter here is Ben Thompson with the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. I'll give him a second to set up slides and, and we'll get started. Thanks again for joining. All right, thanks Adriana. Uh, we're ready to go here. And our webinar today is hosted by myself as well as Dr. Clinton Campbell, the State Operations Coordinator with the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine, and Justin Bush, the Executive Coordinator with the Washington Invasive Species Council. Today's webinar includes an introduction to urban forest pests, uh, as well as a review of the Urban Forest Pest Readiness Playbook. Then we're going to talk about some resources that uh, can be used to help close the readiness gap for municipalities out there in the state, uh, as well as a question and answer period at the end. So urban forests lie at the interface of trade, the movement of people, and neighboring forest and agricultural resources. Goods and people coming into the area bring with them the risk of introducing non-native urban forest pests that have the potential to devastate resources, economies, and ways of life. If and when an invasive pest does arrive here in Washington, there is a high probability that pests will land in an urban area due to the high number of people coming and going on a daily basis. Western Washington is not only heavily urbanized, but the moderate climate allows us to grow plants and trees from all over the globe. Should an invasive pest from another part of North America or another part of the world land in western Washington, it is possible that pest will find vegetation from its native ecosystem to feed on, increasing the chances that breeding populations could develop. A single detected pest can, and often does, indicate the presence of a much larger population. Without organizational structures and prevention methods in place, the worst of these pests can have costly, irreversible and lasting impacts to the forest they infest. Ultimately, if an invasive pest is detected and a response is not successful, the result is a new established pest requiring long-term and costly controls to mitigate the impacts to surrounding agricultural economies and natural ecosystems. Costly quarantines, lost profits, and perpetual management costs for damaging insect and diseases is estimated to cost in the billions of dollars annually in the United States. Due to the nature of pest infestations, local municipalities and individuals typically bear the long-term costs. Overall, the overall goal of this urban forest pest readiness project is to prevent new populations through increasing prevention uh, and policies. We also seek to better position ourselves as a state to detect and eradicate new invasive species at the earliest possible point, thus 
avoiding the need for containment and long-term management. As you can see on this graph here, we all prefer to be operating on the prevention end of the scale in the bottom left corner, uh, where that's very low cost. Uh, but as time goes on, should an invasive species get introduced, we definitely don't want to go much past that green area for eradication because that is the moment when we can actually get a handle on the pest. Once uh, once the pest population grows and gets beyond that level into the kind of yellow, orange, and definitely into the red, then the management costs get exceptionally high and that cost is borne by municipalities and landowners. Urban forests provide measurable positive outcomes for human health, transportation, water quality, jobs, economic development, and safety. Urban trees provide a cooling effect and reduce pollution. Maintaining urban forest health and these positive outcomes will continue to be challenged by climatic stressors such as rising temperatures, drought, and shifting precipitation patterns which are expected to increase tree stress and pest vulnerabilities in the Pacific Northwest. The management of dead and dying trees in the urban forest is costly. For example, local governments across the country spend an estimated 1.7 billion each year to remove trees killed by non-native insect pests. Homeowners spend an additional 1 billion to remove and replace these trees, also lost to invasive pests. In addition, homeowners suffer an additional 1.5 billion per year in lost property value. Without organizational structures in place, the worst of these pests can have irreversible and lasting impacts to the urban forest they infest. Without intervention, a pest can quickly spread to urban forests outside of the urban area and throughout the Western United States. To highlight the very real risks of invasive pests, I'd like to introduce Clinton Campbell with the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine, who will be covering some case studies of invasive pest outbreaks. Yes, thank you, Ben. Uh, I'll begin with uh, slide number seven. And what I'd like to do is uh, provide a little context and background uh, as to why a uh, urban forest pest readiness playbook has real value. And what I'm gonna talk about is a pest that uh, we deal with by and large year in and year out, uh, another pest that we have dealt with successfully, and then also a pest that uh, we can probably anticipate we will be dealing with at some point. In the slide that you see, uh, this tree trunk is representative of what they see back east in the gypsy moth permanently infested area. And uh, what uh, you see here, the white objects are female European gypsy moths. The buff or tan objects are the egg masses that they lay on trees and many other things. And uh, this is not always uh, indicative of what they have, but uh, most of the time they have either outbreaks or certainly uh, detectable populations, which uh, fortunately we do not. So if we can move to slide number eight, please. And gypsy moth is essentially the classical invasive species. It arrived in the United States in 1869 and has spread throughout many states back east and also in eastern Canada in that time. And it's a, a traveler that can move with various items, many items, and uh, Consequently, we do get it out here in the West, uh, incidentally, uh, almost every year. And fortunately, we have ways of uh, preventing its establishment. It is a very serious defoliator of hundreds of trees and shrubs. And then there's also an Asian form of the gypsy moth that has an even greater threat potential because it feeds on even more trees and shrubs. And in the case of the Asian gypsy moth, the female moth is flight capable, which uh, would allow it to spread very fast, whereas the European gypsy moth, the female, cannot fly. If we can move to slide number nine, please. I mentioned that European gypsy moth came into this country in 1869. It was in Medford, Massachusetts. And in this map, you will see what's referred to as the generally infested area. And uh, it's Certainly uh, on the leading edge there in uh, Wisconsin and down to essentially uh, North Carolina is uh, the leading edge and uh, the permanently infested area is essentially everything to the 
the north and the east of that uh, leading edge. The different colored counties there uh, simply show when they entered the quarantine uh, that the USDA has for gypsy moth back east. We can go to slide number 10, please. This is a uh, representation of the kind of damage that is seen back east, uh, massive defoliation events. Now, it's not a case of this necessarily happening everywhere, every year, but uh, certainly, and there are cyclic aspects to gypsy moth, but even so, it's a very serious pest and uh, one that we certainly recognize that we do not want to have in the West for reasons I'll touch on here in just a moment. If we can go to slide 11, please. The environmental impacts of gypsy moth, of course, uh, focus on trees and shrubs, uh, at least initially. And what you see in this particular graphic is just a quick listing of some of the uh, preferred hosts, especially oaks and poplars. Uh, take note of the fact that uh, some of the listed riparian habitat hosts are very, very prominent and important here in the state of Washington. And then the other host trees, likewise, very important uh, parts of the environment here. And these are things that are all at risk to uh, both European and Asian gypsy moth. If we could go to slide 12, please. And looking a little further at the environmental impacts, the fact that it's a defoliator and you have defoliation events, uh, certainly if those are consistent over a number of years, you can have weakened forests. Uh, weakened forests then have the potential for damage by other forest pests, probably more than normal. And this can lead to cascading effects, uh, such as with gypsy moth outbreaks, you can get uh, defoliation of streamside or riparian trees. This can decrease the shading that those trees provide. That will lead to increased stream temperatures, and that in turn can affect fish and other aquatic fauna, uh, regardless of whether it's an urban environment or a uh, rural environment. We can go to slide number 13, please. So to wrap up a little bit on gypsy moth, it's a very serious pest. Uh, both the European form and the Asian form, but the Asian form, again, because of its host list and its uh, capable uh, travel on its own, is a far worse pest. Establishment of gypsy moth would mean environmental and economic damage, with some costs being never-ending, such as uh, the cost of quarantines and things like that. Fortunately, there are good tools to both detect and control populations that are just getting started. And uh, we're fortunate that we have that for gypsy moth. We do not necessarily have that combination for other forest pests and other pests as well. And uh, it's been a cooperative effort uh, here in the state of Washington for well over 40 years to prevent the uh, introduction of both forms of the gypsy moth. If we could go to slide 14, please. The next thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is something you've probably also heard about, and that is the Asian longhorn beetle, which uh, we certainly are on the lookout for that. And uh, there is there are, are, are areas back east that uh, are dealing with it, and some have successfully dealt with it. Um, interestingly enough, I saw about two weeks ago that I think they said New York City has eradicated Asian longhorn beetle. And as you see in this graphic, uh, it got there in 1996. So that's been a long time to get to that point of getting rid of it. If we can go to slide 15, please. Here in the state of Washington, we have dealt with a very close relative of the Asian longhorn beetle, known as the citrus longhorn beetle, uh, despite the name, it has great uh, relevance to us because maple trees and other things are among its favorite host plants. We can go to slide 16, please. And in this case, with the citrus longhorn beetle, uh, back in 2001, some trees that were brought in from Korea uh, under permit uh, that were dwarfed trees for the bonsai industry 
were being held under a uh, formal quarantine in a nursery. And uh, even though these trees had been looked at in an inspection station that USDA has, uh, there was really no way at that time to uh, detect some of the things that might be in some of these trees. And citrus longhorn beetle happened to be one of them. And so at this particular nursery, it was noticed that some of these trees were uh, having beetles coming out of them. And unfortunately, some of these beetles escaped into the environment. If we can go to slide 17, please. Here's an example of the uh, kind of thing that was seen in these dwarf trees. This is uh, the exit hole where the adult beetle chewed its way out. And uh, even though it's a, a small tree and a big beetle, it was enough to uh, allow the maturation and development of uh, those insects. If we can go to slide 18, please. So what we had in this situation was uh, some beetles that had escaped into the environment, open environment. And uh, of course, we wanted to prevent uh, something happening here that would be similar to what was going on with Asian longhorn beetle back east. And so uh, we established a quarantine and we also went about uh, removing host trees that were uh, thought capable or known to be capable of having citrus longhorn beetle. And this is an example of what uh, the primary area looked like both before uh, we had to deal with the trees and after we dealt with them. I will add that uh, we did work on uh, getting things revegetated. And uh, so, you know, now it looks certainly much different than it did back in 2002. Nonetheless, uh, this is a, a large uh, thing to do. and. Uh, is an attention getter and is one of those things where unfortunately sometimes it's necessary to you know take uh, certain kinds of actions even though uh, uh, you know it may not be universally uh, accepted if we can go to slide 19 please the next and last test i want to talk about is one that uh, we have not dealt with whereas we deal with gypsy moth every year and we have dealt with citrus longhorn beetle in urban environments. We uh, would expect, based on what's happening back east, that the emerald ash borer, which is also an Asian origin beetle, is something that we will quite possibly have to deal with here as well. If we can go to slide 20. This is an example of the kind of boring that the emerald ash borer does. It's not the deep kind of boring that uh, Asian and citrus longhorn beetle do, but it's certainly enough to kill the trees by virtue of its disruption of water and nutrient flow in the tree. And uh, with enough beetles, it doesn't take uh, a lot of time to have this kind of thing show up. If we can go to slide 20, please. Back east. Unfortunately, what probably contributed to the spread of emerald ash borer was the fact that uh, dead ash trees have limited use, uh, but one use is firewood. And firewood, like many other things, can get moved around and, and does get moved around, either commercially or uh, through uh, you know people putting it on the backs of campers or whatever the case may be. And uh, even though there are quarantines in place, uh, it doesn't always get out to everybody and things can still happen. Uh, as we're sometimes fond of saying, uh, you know, anything that moves can move a pest. And in this case, uh, firewood and emerald ash borer are a good example of that kind of situation. We can go to slide 22, please. This map is from uh, October 1st, actually. So it's uh, only a month old in terms of its currency. And what you see highlighted in yellow there are all the counties that are quarantined for the emerald ash borer, which means that uh, you know things really shouldn't be moved uh, out of a quarantine area unless they've been inspected and or treated. That would include things like firewood and, and other kinds of uh, articles. The thing to take note of here is if you look to Colorado, 
and you'll see there there's one county where Boulder, Colorado is, currently has emerald ash borer. And uh, so it's uh, right there on the edge of the Rockies. And uh, we don't know exactly, you know, what the timing may be before it manages to somehow get across the Rockies from there or certainly from further back east. But given the spread of this, um, you know, we recognize that it's got great potential both on its own and through human aided spread to move around fast distances. And then uh, my last slide, slide 23, please. This is uh, essentially a, a threat potential slide because this slide shows the uh, distribution of ash trees across the country. And uh, you can certainly see that uh, in the eastern half of the country, uh, lots of ash and also lots of uh, uh, red dots there showing uh, emerald ash borer presence and such. And then, of course, on the west coast, you see that our Oregon ash is uh, what's being represented there. And so we certainly have great potential for uh, this particular beetle becoming a, a concern and a, actually a problem at some point. It's, this may be a case of not if, but when. So we'll just have to see. There are traps available for it. We do look for it, but uh, nonetheless, it's a, uh, it's a serious pest. And it's the kind of thing that, like these others, are ones that uh, you know affect both urban environments as well as uh, everywhere else. And so this is why a cooperative effort and a partnership with uh, everybody who will be using this playbook is very important. So uh, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Um, my name is Justin Bush, and I'm the Executive Coordinator of the Washington State Invasive Species Council. And I'm going to be speaking to you about the Urban Forest Pest Readiness Playbook, which is uh, brand new, actually just was uploaded to our website this morning. This playbook provides action to close a gap in readiness and response capabilities between community leaders managing urban forests, the state, and the federal responders. And as uh, Clinton uh, pointed out, that it takes a cooperative effort. It's really something that affects all of us, and we are all key to the solution. So the Washington State Urban Forest Pest Readiness Playbook is now available. You can visit invasive species, period WA, period GOV, and you can download it there. And there will be a, a link uh, that you'll see later on. The playbook provides a set of actions that towns, cities, counties, tribal governments, and urban forestry programs should take to address the threat of forest pests. And the purpose of the playbook is to close the gap in readiness and response between communities and those that are responding at the state and the federal level. After using the playbook, you should have an understanding of your own organization's preparedness and you'll have documentation of what you know and a path forward to improving your urban forest pest readiness capabilities. This playbook is the product of almost a, a year's worth of work and the playbook was developed to be used by communities that manage urban forests. This isn't a task that any one of us can take on alone and you'll be best served to bring together a collaborative team. And that should include multiple organizations, people with different levels of expertise, and people that have different authorities, depending on the size, the structure, and complexity of your jurisdiction. Really, almost anyone in your community can act as a convener to bring this together, uh, to bring partners together to implement the actions in that playbook. And so whatever your job or your role is, you have a role. There are multiple roles that a playbook user in their own network may play in detecting or managing or even responding to urban forest pests. And users of the playbook should consider involving that wide range of stakeholders. And ultimately, this will determine the level of success in your planning efforts, in detecting pests, and future management and restoration should the worst happen.
here you can see how to use the playbook and each playbook uh, action includes this following format. So the title, key questions, the specific product that will be produced, and the frequency that that product will have to be revisited. This is uh, kind of like a, a continuum amount of planning. And if you want to be successful, it's not something that you create once, but you actively revisit some of these things at different frequencies to ensure success. And successful use of the playbook really depends on a flexible approach uh, where different actions and tasks are implemented strategically as well as opportunistically. Uh, you don't have to do everything at once, but if you see the opportunity to do something, you should certainly seize the moment. Users can prioritize actions based on the gaps identified in the, in the assessment you will be taking due to political or stakeholder interests, and then as well as the available resources that are available to your organization. So where to start? You should identify one or more playbook leads within your organization to coordinate the planning process. And the playbook lead should understand the issues and the risks of urban forest pests. And be sure to consider the characteristics of these high-risk pests as they pertain to your specific geographic area. And this will impact how you need to implement the actions in the playbook and who else you'll need to include in your approach. So one thing that you will be doing is taking a self-assessment and first, we want you to understand the risk. And the risk to your organization and not understanding that risk is not being aware of the natural resources that you're trying to protect and not knowing the different vulnerabilities to those resources. Secondly, we want to measure your capacity to support a response. And if you don't do this, if all of these actions, you risk being disorganized, uh, having a confusing planning process that drains local resources and decreases your ability to effectively respond to the pest. Next, you will be assessing your organization's ability to expedite informed decision making. And the, the risk in not uh, being prepared in this area is that you may be misinformed or slow paced decision making might actually impact your ability to quickly and effectively respond and protect the natural resources in your area. Lastly, you'll be assessing your community support to expand your impact. And if you don't uh, improve the, the areas in this, uh, this assessment area, you risk poor communication uh, you may have issues uh, between different community members or stakeholders, and um, inexperienced team members make it really difficult uh, to detect and respond to these, these pests. And so um, you will be grade, graded, and um, that will help you identify different actions to take uh, to improve your preparedness. So based on your self-assessment, you then will move into the actions. And there's specific things that have been identified to help uh, take your assessment and increase it in the short and the long term. And the way that the actions are broken up are they list key questions. There's uh, an identification of the specific products or product uh, through the action. There is an assessment of frequency and uh, following the action. And then there's specific considerations and also tasks. And one example that we're drilling in on uh, has to do with uh, understanding risk in the self-assessment. And so here is an example here, uh, really simple questions, yes or no, but they're weighted. And based on your result, um, you then will be given specific action. So uh, in this case, in the assessment, you will be looking at your tree resources, and then you will be assigning a score. And let's say uh, you, your organization took the self-assessment and said, well, we really want to focus on one specific action, which is the tree inventory and canopy map. 
So here, there are specific key questions that you want to be asking. There then is uh, readiness products, so tree inventories and canopy maps, as well as a frequency that your organization should be expecting to uh, update that material. There then are specific tasks that you'll be taking to uh, implement that action. And so we tried to make it as, um, as scalable as possible, uh, but also be very detailed. And so um, we feel like it, this should be a great uh, example of um, how this works. And then other, so there are 20 different actions that are associated with the key questions. And as you take the self-assessment, um, you will then have actions um, to become more prepared. And the readiness product uh, includes many different potential actions. So here you can see identification of priority pest species. Uh, that could be going through a risk assessment for your community based on the pathways or the resources or the specific species. And in other ways, it could be uh, building a response framework or identifying available resources and um, part of that includes training and operations, uh, such as uh, practicing incident command and having those structures in place. And um, going through this, just know that uh, you're not on your own. Uh, the organizations that work together to uh, create this project are here in the long term to help you. And um, Ben will talk more about that in a minute with some of the, the technical assistance they can provide. So going through the playbook, one of the cross-cutting elements that's tied to many different actions from outreach and education to public messaging to notification if there's a pest detection and managing stakeholder interactions and really that trigger of response is reporting a detection. And so following a detection, the process of making a report is key. This is also something that can be done by the general public, by volunteers, by staff of your organization, and this can trigger the response process. And something that we wanted everyone to be aware of is that the Washington Invasive Species Council's online reporting system and smartphone app for uh, iOS and Android devices is both a free and a streamlined resource. The app and the website include fact sheets on different invasive species. And so it acts not only as a notification system, but also as a field guide that can be available at any point. And with this, I'm now going to pass it to Ben Thompson. So this uh, gets into our third phase of the webinar where we're talking about some available resources. And I'm just gonna start with a, kind of a quick run through on our program. So the Washington State Department of Natural Resources Urban and Community Forestry Program is non-regulatory and we work to assist local governments with planting and sustaining healthy trees and vegetation wherever people live and work in Washington State. Most of our program funding comes from the USDA Forest Service and we supplement that funding with grants from other sources, such as the one from APHIS that funded this project. The good news is that the legislature has provided some state funding for one additional FTE during the last legislative session. Those monies have not yet been received, but we anticipate hiring that position in 2020. Our program is currently supported by the Washington Community Forestry Council, which is a statewide body of urban forestry stakeholders that are appointed by the Commissioner of Public Lands to advise DNR on urban forestry issues across the state. Collectively, our mandate is to provide technical, financial, and educational assistance to local governments, tribal governments, 501c3 nonprofit organizations, and educational institutions throughout the state. Furthermore, the Urban Forestry Program is housed within the agency's newly created Forest Health and Resiliency Division, which is more broadly responsible for monitoring forest health issues statewide. By way of financial assistance, we are offering two grants this year that were just announced earlier this month. Both grants are due no later than 4 p.m. on Thursday, December 12th. The first, our Community Forestry Assistance Grants, have a similar look and feel from, uh, from from past year's grants and are open to communities of all sizes. Tribes, educational institutions, and 501c3 nonprofit organizations are also eligible to apply. This grant can fund many traditional types of urban forestry projects, including but not limited to canopy assessments, tree inventories and maintenance plans, urban forest management plans, developing ordinances, 
public education campaigns, and tree planting projects. Communities could also use the playbook to identify gaps in readiness, then apply for a community forestry assistance grant to fund a project that will close one or more of those gaps. The maximum request for this grant is 20,000 and the minimum request is 5,000 with a 100% match. The second grant, our Community Engagement and Planning Grant, has a different focus. The intent of this grant is to produce beneficial outcomes for Washington residents living within areas of high environmental health disparity that score six through 10 according to the Washington health, Environmental Health Disparities Map. That's the picture in the lower, uh, image in the lower right of the slide. The Environmental Health Disparities Map is an interactive web map hosted by the Washington State Department of Health that identifies areas where residents may have relatively greater or relatively lesser exposure to environmental pollutants and hazards. We're asking grantees to work directly with residents or community-based organizations representing those residents to implement urban forestry projects that address in adverse environmental conditions. All projects should address a community identified need and have arborists, foresters, landscape architects, or other allied professionals involved. In places where there are not strong relationships between the urban forestry professionals and community-based organizations, this grant can be used to fund projects such as using consultants or facilitators to convene stakeholders for learning about each other's perspectives, identifying shared needs or goals, discussing opportunities or processes for ongoing collaboration, or scoping future project ideas, for example. In places where local relationships are already strong, more traditional types of urban forestry projects that I mentioned earlier can be funded with this grant. The maximum request is 20,000 and the minimum request is 5,000 with a 50% match. So both grants could be used to fund projects that incorporate use of the pest readiness playbook. The community engagement and planning grant has a smaller match but requires working closely with community organizations to do work within areas of high environmental health disparity. Again, both grants are due no later than 4 p.m. on Thursday, December 12th. And you can access our website at www.dnr.wa.gov and the extended hyperlink for the financial assistance tab that uh, includes links to our grant applications is, uh, can be found there. But if you simply go to dnr.wa.gov slash urban forestry, that will take you to our main page. Uh, there's some other good news as far as next steps for the playbook. Uh, and we don't yet have an agreement in place, but the USDA Forest Service that provides funding to our program has committed funds to our program to continue work that builds upon the successes of this playbook. In partnership with the Washington State Department of Agriculture and the Washington Invasive Species Council, the DNR Urban Forestry Program will provide continuing education and technical assistance to help communities use the playbook to assess community preparedness, risk, and vulnerability to exotic pests. We will also develop, deploy, and host a tree inventory data collection tool to facilitate rapid response preparedness among Washington communities. And we will assist communities with development of community pest preparedness plans based on inventory data collected within their communities. Pardon me. Um, we hope to have an agreement signed by the end of this year. Keep an eye out in our TreeLink newsletter, and that's DNR TreeLink, all one word, dnrtreelink.wordpress.com for additional updates about this work. Initial funding for the Urban Forest Pest Readiness Playbook was provided by the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine. The funding that I just talked about uh, for implementation of the Urban Forest uh, Pest Readiness Playbook uh, is funded by the United States Department of Agriculture Forest Service. This project began as a collaboration between the Washington Invasive Species Council and the Washington State Department of Natural Resources Urban and Community Forestry Program. The Washington State Department of Agriculture was brought in as a key partner since they are the lead agency for on the ground monitoring, response, treatment, and quarantine of invasive pest species in Washington State. Uh, the City of Seattle and Washington State University Extension were also brought in as cooperators on our steering committee uh, that include myself, Blakey Lockman with the U.S. Forest Service, Brianna Widener with the Invasive Species Council, uh, Clinton Campbell, who you heard from earlier, Glenn Kohler with the Washington State Department of Natural Resources, Justin Bush, who you've heard from. Uh, Kathy Sheehan with the U.S. Forest Service, Lyndon Lantman, uh, my supervisor with the Washington State Department of Natural Resources Urban Forestry Program, Melissa Fisher with the Department of Natural Resources, Shauna Batista with the USDA Forest Service, Stephanie Helms with the Seattle Department of Transportation, uh, Sven Eric Spickiger with the Washington State Department of Agriculture, and Todd Murray with Washington State University Extension.
This is Justin Bush again, and um, we, um, I think, have explained that we've got a really great resource for you. There's potential funding and technical assistance available to help you implement them, the plan. And um, really, it, it takes an army here to be successful. And so we're kind of inviting you to join the Urban Forest Pest uh, Readiness Community and to learn more and keep involved by visiting our website. And that's uh, invasivespecies.wa.gov slash project slash pest ready. Or you can just simply go to invasivespecies.wa.gov and it's on our homepage. So you can go to that site now and download the, pro the playbook. And um, we definitely um, want you all to stay informed. And if you want to be notified of uh, a new website launch, which is coming soon, uh, as well as uh, upcoming potential grant opportunities through the Department of Natural Resources, you can also sign up for our email list by visiting invasivespecies.wa.gov. And with that, we will transition to some live question and answer. Audrey, are you there? Thank you all. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So thank you all for joining us today. I'm listening in on the webinar. Those links that were shared um, over the course of the presentations, I included in the chat window. So if you haven't seen those already um, and wanted an easy link to click, uh, please go ahead and visit there. So there's that call to um, just kind of summarizing here some of those call to actions. Feel free to visit and download the playbook at invasivespecies.wa.gov um, slash project slash pest ready. There's going to be the Washington State Department of Natural Resources newsletter uh, um, tree link, which you can sign up for to receive, and um, the Invasive Species Council um, email list with updates that will go out. So other ways to stay involved. Um, we don't have too many questions. so. Um, and this might be a stumper to get us going, but I just wanted to see in case um, anyone, any of our presenters can um, speak to this. Um, do we know that if ISA members would be able to receive credits for participating and joining the webinar today? Uh, we did not pursue ISA credits for this webinar in advance, but, um, but certainly we can uh, uh, you know, they can use a copy of their registration for the webinar to prove that they were here, um, as well as we can uh, provide a PDF copy of the presentation, and they, they will be able to pursue credits on their own through ISA's post-approval process. And if they have any questions, they can get in touch with me directly. Um, my email address is right there on the screen at the bottom. And that was Ben sharing that. So thank you, Ben. Um, that was our main question. I do have something that um, I'd like to ask you all to maybe speak to a little bit more about um, how this playbook is unique and kind of what types of information and work was done to synthesize information that um, wasn't like easily available on websites, um, on your agency websites as is. Um, how, you know, how does this playbook provide some really unique information and synthesis um, to make it a, a useful, valuable resource? Adriana, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so how, like what elements of the playbook are really unique? What kind of new information can users um, find in this playbook that wasn't already available on the agency websites? And I'm really thinking about um, some of the information with authorities and contact information that people can find using the playbook. Yeah, I mean, my personal opinion is that depending on what angle you're approaching this from, you're going to find information that's new to you. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, everything that's in the playbook already exists somewhere in, in you know, on the internet or, or through one of our agencies. But by bringing together APHIS and the State Department of Agriculture and the Invasive Species Council and Washington DNR, I mean, we've learned things from each other in the process of developing this playbook. So I think that the end users uh, will also learn things and find things that were available, but uh, until now that they've been synthesized into one location uh, where it's easy to work through it and easy to find them, uh, it may have been less easy to find those resources before. So I think there's something in it for everyone, depending on your background and your interest. And this is, is Justin, uh, I'll just, uh, piggyback on that. 
I, I think that that's especially true. This this will have information that um, typically is only shared on specific agency web pages, and so uh, it outlines the authorities of all the different federal agencies and state agencies. Uh, kind of explains their role uh, in different w ways, and so. If something is a widespread insect uh, within most of the state and isn't federally regulated, there's always questions about like, well, why, why is that so, and why, or why do you care about this pest in this area but not necessarily another? And I feel like we try to explain uh, throughout the plan uh, what kind of the minimum would be as well as the maximum in terms of response to help communities better understand the full spectrum of what response looks like. Great, thanks you too. And we have some more questions trickling in, so I'll just, um, we'll work through them as they show up here. So we have a question from um, someone here who's a local brush clearing contractor who works in both like urban and rural areas. And um, they're really excited to see this playbook and they're already regularly referencing um, the invasive species reporting app. Um, they have a question about um, the resources and information that's in the playbook that is going to be really helpful for local homeowners and local landowners, um, either that they can use to educate um, these folks or um, that they can like refer them to? Yeah, that, that's um, this is gonna be a good resource for, for anyone that has a stake in urban and forest pests. And um, if, if Clint Campbell's still on the, on the phone, um, Dr. Campbell, feel free to weigh in, but it really takes the whole community to prepare and respond to these pests. And um, the, the landowners, whether it's an agency or a city or the public, uh, we're all in it together. And, um, and Clinton, I think you can probably touch on this better than I. Yeah, I'll just add, Justin, that uh, everything that's been said is exactly correct. And uh, yeah, it, it's a, a rather broad, comprehensive resource uh, in a compact uh, form. And uh, one of the things that uh, I take away from it is that uh, I think for anybody as a user or a potential user that is that uh, it's uh, it's thought provoking. It uh, it brings up things that uh, you might not have thought about. I have this happen to me plenty as well. And so I like to see things like this that, uh, you know, force me to uh, maybe <laughs> think, uh, you know, in ways that I hadn't considered before. So. Uh, it'll be a good resource for everybody. One thing that I'll add to it too is that um, our, our target audience with the playbook is local jurisdictions. Uh, really anyone who's managing uh, natural resources in the public domain. But uh, if it's a homeowners association or even just a large landowner, I mean, they can certainly go through the playbook um, to sort of evaluate their own readiness, knowing that some uh, some dimensions of the playbook may not specifically apply to them, but it's certainly a place where as they work through it, they might learn about new resources that could be available to them. Um, but also it could be a catalyst uh, for um, some of those folks that live, say, in unincorporated county areas to be starting a conversation with the county saying, hey, there's this resource that's available. Let's sit down and have a conversation about you know, kind of where we're at and, and how we can improve. Yeah, thank you all for sharing that. And um, just to add one additional piece here is really considering that um, a, a lot of people need to be involved to be successful. I think we see that, the, and like Ben said, the homeowner themselves could be a stakeholder in picking up this playbook, um, or there's kind of ways to identify and see ways that they would be involved in potentially creating um, a, a team or to inform the work um, that the city is doing, the municipality is doing, um, to just be more more prepared and more more connected. Um, so thank you for that question. So we have another question about um, specifically um, would this presentation be able to be provided to the Washington Native Plant Society chapter meeting in Olympia? And I think just a broader question there: Are are you all um, available or planning on um, being able to take this presentation um, on the road to some um, to in person meetings? Uh, I'll, I'll guess I'll take a stab at this. This is Justin. 
this webinar is being recorded and um, we intend to publish it on our YouTube account uh, within uh, the next two to three weeks. And we'll send that link uh, to everyone that registered and you're free to share that with friends, family, and, and other folks that may have an interest. Uh, if you would uh, like to have this done in person, I think we're certainly open to this. Um, it may be uh, streamlined in some ways depending on people's availability. It, it's probably unlikely that the three of us will be present right. in one place again, but um, we certainly are open to that. Ben, what yeah, do you think? I, I agree. And Dr. Campbell? We'll uh, do whatever we need to do. Excellent. Good, great question. Great, thank you. We have a few more minutes and a few more questions, so I'll keep going. So are the DNR grants that were mentioned, are those available each year? They have been available each year, but our funding for the grants is contingent on, on uh, the continuation of funding provided by, uh, provided by Congress. So. Um, they have continued to provide funding for our program every single year, um, but we can't guarantee it from year to year. Great, thank you. And then another question here, um, is, there an, an, is there an emerging threat uh, platform, outlet, or bulletin for the state? And I'm, I'm guessing that's asking about if there's like one, um, you can have one single spot single stop sign up place where someone could go to hear about these big concerns concerns and issues this this is justin and um if it's related specifically to invasive species issues the invasive species council's email list is a great place uh, to start um, we hold quarterly we send out quarterly email updates and um, that certainly would include information on new pests that show up in the state or a new area of the state. Uh, anything that would be, uh, you know, a, a, a response target, like something that was feather regulated, we would be sending out a special notification. Um, I would also say that we have uh, social media, so Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and, and that's a good way to keep, uh, touch, keep in touch with the council on an hourly basis. Um, and then uh, I guess I'll defer to Ben and Clinton. Well, I would just say that I think that if your interest is specifically in invasive species, then being connected with the Invasive Species Council is probably the best uh, best approach for you. If your interest is more in, in urban forestry and forest health in a more general sense, um, our, our program newsletter, the Tree Link, is a good resource to connect with as well because we will be uh, providing uh, information about uh, forest health issues that arise throughout the state on a periodic basis. And then if there is some kind of a, an outbreak that's either um, of major consequence or a potential major consequence, we would be working with the Invasive Species Council to help distribute their, uh, their notifications about that insect or that event through our newsletter as well. Thank you all for that. I don't see any more questions here. So if that is everything from our attendees, that that cuts us out, um, cuts us off a couple of minutes early um, for you all to continue on to lunches and other activities. Um, any other final thoughts or um, words from our um, organizers and hosts? Sure. This is Justin. I'd just like to thank everyone for their time today. We know how to prevent and stop invasive species, but the trick is that it takes all of us working together to do so. So um, we're looking forward to working with you on this. And if there's anything we can do to help your organization get more pest ready, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Thank you.